Special segment now, the mobsters and the movies. The movies have always been a tempting target for organized crime since the money there can be so big. Well, tonight, Brian Ross reports on the movie making of two men who also appear in front of the cameras. The cameras of the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. This is a private screening for members of the cast and backers of a yet-to-be-released movie called Cry of the City. The movie stars Sammy Davis Jr. and is about life in the ghetto and breakdancing. The screening was part of a big rap party in Florida last month to celebrate the wrap-up of filming on location in the Miami area. This is where it all started. It was a big event for the two executive producers of the movie, Jerry Zimmerman and Michael Francisi, two newcomers to Hollywood who in only a few years have been able to raise millions of dollars to make and distribute movies. Closely watching all this in surveillance vans across the street were police and FBI agents investigating Franzese, Zimmerman, and organized crime in the movie business. To law enforcement authorities, Zimmerman and Franzese, shown here on their way to a grand jury appearance in 1973, are well known, not as movie producers, but as hoodlums. Zimmerman was convicted of perjury in an organized crime case in 1978 and is scheduled to be in court in Los Angeles tomorrow on grand theft charges. And according to an FBI affidavit on file in federal court, Michael Franzese is now a high-ranking member of an organized crime family, the Colombo Mafia family, and was recently charged with racketeering, extortion, loan sharking, and the investment of Mafia money in legitimate business. Authorities say the power behind Franzese and Zimmerman in the movie business is Michael Franzese's father, John Sonny Franzese, one of the top Mafia bosses in the country, who was released from prison just last month and met at the prison gate by his son Michael. Federal authorities say Michael Franzese is not the first member of his father's crime family to go into the motion picture business. The elder Franzese and his mob associates were the men behind the distribution of a number of sex and violence films, including Deep Throat and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which made millions for the mob. United States Attorney Rudolph Giuliani brought the recent racketeering charges against Michael Franzese. At least according to this complaint, uh, it would seem that Michael Franzese is unfortunately following in the footsteps of his father. 35, take two! On location in Miami with the movie Cry of the City, Michael Francisi was accepted as a big-time Hollywood producer, and his partner, Jerry Zimmerman, even took to directing the actors and dancers. Let's get a heart in it last night. Let's go. Come on. Authorities said that Francisi's and Zimmerman's effort to make a feature-length musical and not a sex film or a violence film is a big move for mobsters to get into the more respectable aspects of the movie business. As Hollywood producers, Zimmerman and Franzese became celebrities in Miami. The Miami bishop gave them a special blessing from the Vatican. And to the astonishment of federal agents, the mayor of Miami Beach gave Franzese the keys to the city and a special police pass. Our police department, as well as the rest of the city, is delighted to have you, and any courtesies that they can extend to you, they will be happy to do so. The mayor later told NBC News he was shocked to hear allegations of Franzese's organized crime connections. In an interview after the movie's cast party, Zimmerman stormed off when the subject of his police record came up. Franzese calmly denied that he or the movie had any ties to the mob. The FBI says you're a member of the Colombo Mafia family. Like I said, the FBI can uh, allege and say whatever they like. They've been doing it for many, many years. But what can I say? That's the FBI. That's law enforcement. But two weeks later, Michael Franzese's career as a movie producer was interrupted, and he was in handcuffs, arrested by the FBI on racketeering charges, one of 14 people charged in an alleged mafia loan sharking and strong arm operation that invested mob money in legitimate businesses. Franzese says he plans to fight the charges, and that neither his arrest, nor his partner's pending criminal trial, nor the bad publicity about mafia ties will in any way stop his big plans for the motion picture business. Brian Ross, NBC News, New York. Good evening. Tonight we begin with a shocking investigative report by Brian Ross on the latest enterprise of organized crime, the mob. The mob goes where the money is, and over the years, it has moved into legitimate businesses as well as drugs and vice. It has controlled construction projects, meatpacking operations, the clothing trade. Now, a new ripoff for the mob. And after a three-month investigation, Brian is prepared to bring us the first of two reports. 
This is the part of Long Island near New York City that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about in The Great Gatsby. Fabulous homes, great wealth. Some of the richest people in the country live here, including the alleged young mafia boss who has just had this place built for him. His name is Michael Francisi, shown here at a party in Florida last year. State and federal law enforcement authorities in New York and Florida say Francisi, who is only in his 30s, is the youngest mafia boss in the country and possibly the richest. Authorities say in the last five years, Francisi and some of the men around him have made perhaps as much as a billion dollars. Not from heroin or cocaine or prostitution or gambling, but from a new mob business. Gasoline. For more than a year now, FBI agents and police in states along the Atlantic coast have been following the movement of hundreds of millions of gallons of gasoline by companies said to be controlled by the Mafia. Authorities say Francisi and other organized crime figures in a very short period of time have taken over or set up their own storage terminals, tanker truck fleets, wholesalers, jobbers, a whole network everything necessary to move gasoline under mob rule from the refinery to the corner gas station. I would compare them to a pack of jackals. These men, who asked that their identities be concealed, say their wholesale gasoline business was taken oh, over by mafia thugs who showed up and threatened to kill them if they wouldn't do business the way the mob wanted them to. Carrying on like this, waving his hands around and going, God damn, it's going to be done my way. I'm the boss around here. I see what goes on around here. It's been done my way. And this is the Mafia's way. Mob-controlled gasoline companies, often working in the middle of the night, sell and deliver one tanker load after another, and just don't pay the federal and state gasoline taxes they're supposed to. It is a bonanza for the mob. In New York State, for example, the taxes due on just one 8,000-gallon tanker load of regular gasoline come to $2,128. And authorities say mob gasoline companies have for years made tens of thousands of tanker runs without paying taxes and without getting caught. And the motorist will come here. Because they don't pay gasoline taxes, the mob sells gasoline to gas stations at prices three to four cents a gallon lower than legitimate dealers can offer. And these men say even local dealers under contract to major oil companies wanted secret deliveries of the mob's cheap gasoline. We had mobile stations, we had Texaco stations, we had Chevron stations, uh, we had Shell stations. Authorities say the Mafia first moved into the gasoline business in New York and is now active in at least 12 other states. By some estimates, the loss in gasoline taxes is as much as one billion dollars. You're talking about billions and billions of ga gallons of gasoline. Robert Dempsey, uh, the head of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, after, after says the mob has been so successful because very little for, checking uh, is done on taxes said, due from gasoline wholesalers. But if, if Florida and New York and New Jersey were examples, it was obvious that they found the loopholes and they jumped into them. And uh, the potential for it being a nationwide uh, scheme in every state that has uh, gasoline tax revenues is, is quite obvious. Florida has been the most aggressive of the states going after the mobsters. One month ago in Costa Rica, Florida investigators arranged a secret meeting with this man, a Panamanian lawyer who helped the mob set up its gasoline front companies. And now, Florida investigators have broken the mob's computer codes, making it possible for investigators to find out how business records were falsified to show tax payments when there were none. The mob's own records show transactions with hundreds of gasoline companies. Better and now, for the first time, industry part. leaders are talking about their fears yeah, of a mafia really takeover. No, Tom Plattis, the president of Highway Oil, one of the country's largest like chains. Said, five years ago, uh, me talking about the mafia and the gasoline business would have been absolutely a, a joke. But it's gotten serious where the point that it could very easily happen. That they could move in and take over? They could take over a substantial portion of it. There have been some arrests. Several mob gasoline companies have been put out of business, and prosecutors in Florida and New York are preparing new charges. But as of now, in many places, gasoline is a mob cargo. Brian Ross, NBC News, New York. Tomorrow night, Brian will show us how the mob hides the millions of dollars that it makes by dodging gasoline taxes. Tonight's special segment, Mob Gas. 
gasoline. Last night, NBC News correspondent Brian Ross reported that organized crime now has muscled into the gasoline business in a big way and cheated the government out of hundreds of millions of dollars of tax dollars. Tonight, Brian reports on some of the ways that the mob uses those dollars. Lock it up. Roll sound. Last year, something very strange happened in movie making. Actors were hired, a director flown in, camera set up. B marker. And big production scenes were shot on location in Miami Beach for a movie that has never been released by a production company that nobody had ever heard of. And the movie's producer was a man every police detective in New York had heard of. Michael Franzese, said by police to be a young, tough boss in the mafia. And now one of the men authorities say was closest to Franzese is locked up in a federal jail in New York and is talking about why a mafia boss set up a movie company. The government's informant is Larry Iarizzo, convicted of tax and mail fraud, who says Franzese's movie company was really an elaborate front, just one of many front companies the mob used to hide millions of dollars from a new mafia racket, gasoline. This was Ira Rizzo six years ago at his desk at Vantage Oil, a big New York gas station chain that he now says he was running for the mob. Authorities say Ira Rizzo is a financial genius who figured out how mobsters could make a fortune by selling huge amounts of gasoline and then keeping for themselves millions in gas tax money due to the states and the federal government. And for years, no one caught on, not tax collectors, not the FBI because the mob was hiding much of its gas tax money here in Panama. Using a phony American passport, Iarizzo traveled to Panama under the name of Salvatore Matthew Carlino and set up front companies that were able to get licensed in the United States to sell gasoline and to collect gas taxes. When American authorities finally figured out what was going on, they found that tens of millions of dollars in missing gas taxes ended up here in the accounts of Panamanian companies located in this building. For example, Houston Holdings, one of the mob's most important front companies. Company records show the president is somebody by the name of Felix Short. We found Felix Short in the small town of Santiago, Panama, where he was making his rounds as a traveling hardware salesman. Short says the only thing he knows about Houston Holdings is that he once got $100 to sign his name on some documents in a lawyer's office where he was a clerk. Well, I'm feeling short. That's all I know. But have you have you been to Florida to work in the oil business? No, I've been I, I've been never in the United States. Never in the United States. Never. What Felix Short of Panama didn't know was that this man was going around Florida calling himself Felix Short. His real name is Charles Yingst, and authorities say he is one of the New York mobsters now charged in Florida with stealing as much as forty million dollars in gas taxes using the mob front Houston Holdings. Robert Dempsey of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. This has an impact on every one of us who buys a gallon of gasoline. We're lining the pockets of an illegal activity rather than having that money going to our schools and our highways and our, our law enforcement and the other kinds of things that we need as a society. And some of the stolen gas tax money has apparently gone into a political campaign fund. NBC News has found that at least five companies, now identified by authorities as mob fronts, made contributions to a campaign fund for New York Governor Mario Cuomo. Federal witness Aya Rizzo has told authorities he was ordered by his mob boss, Michael Francisi, to write a check to the Cuomo campaign. And New York State election records show contributions from Houston Holdings, Lasez Petroleum, Northbrook Assets, CMC Corporation, and Future Positions Corporation, all on November 15, 1983, and all for $1,000. The governor's office said Cuomo would not be available to talk about the contributions. In a letter, a spokesman said the governor did not know of the contributions and that they were, quote, unsolicited and had no bearing whatsoever on the actions of the Cuomo administration. The spokesman said New York State had taken, quote, vigorous steps to put gasoline tax evaders out of business. All five companies that gave contributions have been put out of business and are now under investigation by New York State and federal authorities. In the last five years, organized crime has made a staggering amount of money in the gasoline business. By some estimates, a billion dollars or more. Much of this has been done in the middle of the night, with mobsters making secret deliveries of mob gasoline, stealing the gas tax money, and hiding it in front companies set up all over the world. 
Gasoline is a heavily taxed item in this country and in many places what was intended to be a tax for the states and the federal government is now a mob tax. Brian Ross, NBC News, New York. In Chicago, the defense rested today in the federal trial of two agents charged with preying on college athletes with pro potential. Correspondent Gary Reeves is covering that trial. The fraud and racketeering trial of sports agents Norby Walters and Lloyd Bloom has revealed dramatic allegations of mob involvement in college athletics. Confessed organized crime captain Michael Franzese testified he paid $50,000 cash to become a silent partner in the agency that once represented 44 potential professional football and basketball stars. Bloom and Walters say they broke no laws when they gave thousands of dollars in gifts and loans to top college players, convincing them to secretly hire the agents months before college rules allow. Most of the agents choose to ignore the rules of the NCAA, which they are not bound by. And most of the young men seem to ignore the rules of the NCAA. And what Norby Walters has done has just come along and joined the gang. The agents targeted young black stars like the University of Iowa's running back Ronnie Harmon. With his father present, Harmon recorded a tape as Walters offered a big loan and monthly payments in exchange for the right to a percentage of Harmon's future pro earnings. Now you have to send Ron 50 or 100 a month and you said I have to go find the money. He now is picking up the money from me. Yeah. And we all also took it gamble. He has to worry about being caught. The agents say they just found a niche in a corrupt system that exploits players for their athletic abilities. Harmon, for example, slid by with a D average, taking classes like billiards and water coloring, finally dropping out after he led his school to the Rose Bowl. School officials say academics come first. The student athlete must be a student first, an athlete second. Players who tried to break their contracts with Bloom and Walters say they were threatened. Chicago Bear Maurice Douglas testified Bloom said he might have somebody break my legs. Francis, nicknamed the Yuppie Don, told jurors he never threatened players, but did provide the muscle that helped Walters prosper in the music business. Francis says he tried and failed to control the Jackson 5's 1981 tour, but claims his reputation in New York's Colombo crime family was enough to convince Dionne Warwick's manager not to fire Walters. Warwick herself testified there were no threats. The agent scandal and their alleged connection to organized crime has prompted at least 15 states to try to toughen the laws that govern agents, hoping to redeem the tarnished image of college sports. Gary Reeves, CBS News, Chicago.